he puts a lot of thought into that, and I appreciate that. And uh, my unmute, okay, let there be sound, there is sound, there we go. Thank you, I saw that hand. And then, you know, Megan grew up in a pastor's home, and, and uh, I love how she plays with heart. My wife plays like that, too. It's not just, you know, playing notes, it's playing heart. Thank you. I had a great time with your pastor and his wife. Uh, they had me twice this week. We went out for Megan's birthday, all of us, so that was good the other day. And the last night, I got salmon and shrimp at their house. So you get invited over there, you don't want to turn it down, okay? I don't know what they always serve, but, man, it was good. Liver and onions. Liver and onions, yeah, that is not on my list. They asked me if I have any allergies, and I said, yeah, liver. That is, uh, I don't know if it's a real allergy, but it's an acquired allergy, you know. I'll eat Brussels sprouts, but I just, uh, anyway. I have had a really good time, and I, kudos to Bill Ritz, who's here tonight after hosting me to play golf today. He asked me if I wanted to go. I'm like, okay, twist my arm. So anyway, he went out. This man is on the threshold of 80. He's not there yet, but threshold. And walks the golf course. We were over at Bunker Hill, and it's, it's hilly. And he walked. And I thought, oh, he'll be home tonight in his easy chair taking a nap. He, he came to church to take a nap tonight. So that is really good, Bill. I am impressed. I had a great time today. Uh, we, we played with a German man named Helmut. And uh, who's from um, uh, San Diego. And I had a good opportunity to talk to him about the Lord at the end. And after Bill treated me to Dunkin' Donuts, I swung by Wawa because I had to get my final iced coffee for the morning because Pastor and I are leaving early to go to the airport. So I got to witness to a guy at Wawa, too. So, you know, the moral of the story is go play golf and go to Wawa. You'll be able to witness. It was really good. Okay. Just kidding. All right. We are going to go to Psalm 91 tonight. Psalm 91. So you were given uh, testimonies. I didn't get to tell you this ahead of time, Pastor. I'm going to preach on the Lord's protection tonight, unrelated to my wife's situation. But my wife's actually not heading to Alabama tonight, turns out. what hap- This just developed before church. Uh, they've been praying about it, and turns out we were monitoring the weather all day. The storm is supposed to hit near the Big Bend of Florida. There are 67 counties in Florida. Every county but three is under a hurricane warning, and Escambia County, where Pensacola is one of the three in the entire state, not under a hurricane warning. Hallelujah. So they're going over to my nephew's house tonight, and they'll, they'll go to church, and then they'll go to my nephew's house and spend the night there. So I'm excited because I'll get to see my wife tomorrow, which is a great idea. And uh, so I'll be with her and then fly back to Philly and out to Harrisburg on uh, Saturday this week, preach in Williamsport, PA next week, fly back out of Harrisburg and Philly down to Pensacola, the next week, I'll be in uh, North Philly, um, uh, Buckingham, PA, near Doylestown, preach there, fly back down. The next week, fly out to Pittsburgh, preach in Clymer, PA, fly back, and then I end up in um, Stonewood, West Virginia, which is near Bridgeport, that area, and uh, that'll be my last meeting away from home, and then I have one in Fort Walton Beach, which is a commute from Pensacola for me, so anyway, that, that rounds out my year. And then we start up again and do it next year. So uh, thank you for praying for us. We have, I have a lot of flying to do. And my normal thing is on the ground with my family, with a trailer, and uh, hoping to have that some closure on that. So anyway, thank you for praying for us. All right, we're in Psalm 91. I don't know if you know that the, the Greeks had this habit of creating gods in their own image. I'm going to mention this the other day. And, you know, we know that the truth is we were made in God's image. But if people don't know God, they tend to fill the void with something, right? And so the Greeks had this habit of creating gods in their own likeness, usually with supernatural human strengths, but also the inherent human weaknesses. And so they had lots of gods, and you know, Venus and Apollos and others. But one of the gods who was allegedly adored by all the others was a god named Pan. Pan means all. And so that, he was named that because apparently they all, in fact, the humans adored him allegedly. You know, this is their mythology. Pan was half goat, half human. A torso of human being, uh, lower region of the body, limbs and all of, uh, of goat. And he was called the shepherd god. He was supposedly the god of the forest and the fields. He was licentious. He was congenial. And he was often mischievous, according to their tradition. So they had this idea that that Pan would hide in the fields or in the forest, and when some ancient traveler was coming by, he would exert his mischievous 
his mischievousness, so his mischievousness. So he'd hide in the woods, and all of a sudden this ancient traveler is coming by, and he'd break a twig. And this would cause the passerby to have a budding sense of apprehension. So the passenger, the passerby would pick up their pace a little bit, and Pan would run on ahead, and unsuspecting person going by has no idea what's happening. So he'd get up on ahead, and he'd start making some animal sounds. Well, now the person would pick up their pace even more. Of course, their heart rate is rising at this point. There's a real sense of foreboding. So Pan would scamper on ahead, and as the passenger was coming, the passerby was coming closer to him, all of a sudden he might do something like let out a blood-curdling scream. And now the person is an all-out bolt, probably never to return to that forest again, experiencing what became known as panic because of the god Pan. Did you know that's where that term came from? That's the origin of the word panic. That's why I told you that story. You know, we're living in perilous times, are we not? The Bible told us, you know, this know also in the last days, perilous times shall come. You know what perilous means? Injurious, harmful, risky. Are we living in those times? But I want to tell you something. Although all the world is falling apart, God tells us, be careful for nothing. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And yet I'll tell you, as a fellow who's gotten to travel all this country and I travel, I think I've been on every interstate. I haven't been on every section of interstate, but I, I've been on every interstate in America as far as I know. I've literally traveled every, uh, every state. I tell you that to qualify my assumption here. It's, it's unnerving to me how much panic and worry has crept into our churches. I used to uh, have a talk with my mom. You know, mom, worry is not a virtue. <laughs> it is a sin. I think mom had the idea sometimes she was helping God out by her anxiety. No, anxiety is not helping God out. It is a sin against God. And I want to talk to you tonight about panic and how we are not to panic. I never saw it so obviously as during the outbreak of COVID in this country. And as now we're approaching, you know, the uncertainty with war in Ukraine and war in Israel and coming election and two assassination attempts on a former president and there's all this anxiety. Let me just tell you, no matter what's happening in the world around you, God does not want you to panic. He doesn't want you to experience worry. Well, Easy for you to say, you know, I'm just like you. I mean, I was feeling it this week, too, as my family's down there with a looming storm coming. This, this may be some whopper storm. But, you know, I was walking the canal the other day, and I'm, I'm going over the psalm that I'm about to preach to you. And that's not why I'm preaching this tonight. But it, I, I don't just preach to people stuff that they need. I need it myself. And I'm meditating on Psalm 91. And as I'm praying and saying, Lord, there is nothing I can do for my family. That's where I really feel handcuffed. I'm away from Florida up here in Jersey, and my family's back there. And I'm walking my wife through this afternoon, pull the ladder out, and having my daughter get up and caulk around a window that had been leaking, you know. And I don't want to have to put that on my 24-year-old daughter right now. I want, to, I want to be there, but I'm not. So I'm, I'm walking, and I'm praying. Lord, I, there's nothing I can do. But I realize now I'm where you want me to be right now, and my family's where you've chosen for them to be right now. And you've said, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Lord, I'm not in perfect peace right now, and that's not your fault. That's my fault. And I'm on this walk along this canal to tell you, this was the other day, um, yesterday. I'm along this canal here to tell you I'm, I'm stressed. It's not right. I know it's sin. Please help me, Lord. Please help me. And you know, by the end of my walk, the Lord just gave me a sense of peace. I'll take care of it. And that's not simply because the hurricane has shifted away. I had the sense that, I, I was reminded a couple years back, we had Hurricane Sally, and my wife and I were up in uh, New England at the time while our girls were home with my mom who was going downhill. And uh, we came home. It was a hurricane out of nowhere. There were trees and limbs everywhere. And incredibly, our trailer was untouched. Our truck was not damaged. There was debris everywhere. Neighbors had damage, but we didn't. And that was totally God. So, so where do you get that kind of peace? Well, you get it from God, who gives it to you through his word. So we're going to look into a passage tonight I call, In the Habitation of the Most High. In the Habitation of the Most High. 
It's Psalm 91. Let me read just a portion of it. Um, I want to cover the whole psalm. It's only 16 verses. Now, let me just tell you at the outset, I will camp on verses 1 and 2 for probably a good part of the message, and then I will move quickly through the others. So when I only am a few minutes on 1 and 2, and you think, are we going to be here all night? We're not, okay? But 1 and 2 really set the foundation for this whole verse, of this whole uh, psalm. But let me just read verses 1 to 7 to start with. Okay, would you follow there? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Now, it's interesting. There is no, there's no title between verses 1 and the, the heading, Psalm 91. Some, some psalms have a, a heading. In fact, go to the previous psalm, Psalm 90. Written by whom? What's the previous psalm? Moses, Psalm 90 was actually one of the oldest pieces of Bible literature we have. Uh, some believe that the Psalm 90 goes back to the time of Genesis, uh, right there with, hey, do you know what book was written before Genesis? Job, yeah, isn't that interesting? That's an interesting thought. The first book written, now it's not the first book of human history, but the first book written deals with the topic of human suffering. And it isn't interesting, who was behind human suffering? It wasn't God was Satan. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? The first book written. Because people always want to know, well, if there's a God, why is there suffering? Hello? Read the book of Job. First book written. But this piece of literature, Psalm 90, goes back to the time of Job, to the time of the book of Genesis. Interesting, uh, as far as the writing of it, okay? Moses was, was the one who wrote. Uh, look at verse 1 of Psalm 90. Lord, thou hast been our, what? Dwelling place in all generations. Okay, how does Psalm 91 open? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Some have surmised that Moses wrote Psalm 91. Others have said, no, it wasn't Moses, it was David. It was David when he was fleeing from Saul and he was in the caves of En Gedi. And I've heard good cases made for either one. The truth is, we don't know. And I think by God's design, we don't know. Interesting, this psalm is so universal, it's applicable to God's people in any period of time, any covenant of time, and uh, it is in, if you know the Lord, if you have a personal relationship with the Lord, the psalm applies to you. If you don't have a relationship with the Lord, the truth of the matter is he wants you to, and we'll talk about how to have that. All right, so I'm going to break it down this way. We're going to carve it up into three areas tonight. Let's start with this, and I told you this would be the the meat and potatoes of the psalm, a premise established. It's verses 1 and 2. Now, you know what a premise is, a little different spelling than promise, okay? A promise is you give your word and you stick to it. A premise is a foundation from which other truths are derived or on which other assumptions are built. A premise. So we have a premise established. So go back, verses 1 and 2. Notice, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. One thing I like to do in my Bible, I, I underline key verses and then I circle key words. And I circled two verbs here, dwelleth and abide. Hey, the other night I preached from John 15. Do you remember what concept we were looking at? It had to do with our relationship to Christ. What was the key word? Do you remember? Abide, yeah. Same as these words here, he that dwelleth, he that uh, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's interesting, the word um, to abide there is the idea, or to dwell, I'm sorry, is to, is to sit down. In fact, Albert Barnes, the famous commentator, said the idea is a, a calm repose of resting, of sitting down like someone does in his house. My favorite piece of furniture in my trailer is my recliner chair. I got a nice little lazy boy in my house, and t to me, if the feet aren't up, I'm not resting, you know? So the other night, I was watching a football game, and man, I said the church... Uh, Mission's a house there. Got a recliner. Hallelujah. I think that's an essential piece. My daughter, who's a graphic designer, when she first got a house, it was all really cute and all, but where's the recliner, honey? You know? So my mind is, uh, I'm not resting until I'm reclining. So feet go up. Uh, usually my girls, so my girls point out, feet go up, lids go shut. You know? But I'm, I'm resting. 
Okay, that's the idea. He that dwelleth in the secret place, he'll abide under the shout of the Almighty. It's talking about constancy, permanency of fellowship with the Lord. We, I dealt with that in depth the other night. But notice, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Okay, what's a secret place? Oh, when I was a kid, we had a tree fort. Oh, you should have seen my tree fort. My dad was a general contractor, so he, he built one above our shed where we kept the mower and all. The tree fort was, was, more awesome, was greater than the shed. The shed was one of those aluminum sheds. But, man, this thing, oh, it was made out of two-by-fours. It had a cedar shake roof on it. Uh, it had two doors, and, a, and it had an uh, angled uh, staircase that came up through the bottom and a, and a ladder that went up the front. I mean, we had the envy of the neighborhood. That was our getaway spot. That was our secret place. You know, if you're a married person, maybe you have a certain place you like to get away. And, um, you know, some of you like um, Marriott is your favorite getaway. Some of you might be, you know, a deer stand, okay? Some of you might like to camp. Now, I live in a camper, so, you know, for us, getaway, I like, I personally like Hawaii. I get to go there every other year in meetings. I think I made my 26th trip to Hawaii last year. And uh, I know, I'm sorry, I lost all your prayer support telling you that. But <laughs> I, I get asked. They, they asked me to come over. So what am I going to say, no? Uh, so, you know, I, I thoroughly love to go. And by the way, I do go to Alabama every year for what that's worth, okay? So just tell you. Uh, he, to dwell is to remain in. It's to be constantly abiding in the secret place. In fact, I jotted this down. When it comes to um, this idea of a premise established, personal time with God is prioritized. You can make that a letter A if you like to make your outlines nice and neat. Personal time with God is prioritized here. I mentioned last night, you know, or two nights ago. Uh, yeah, last night too on meditating. We, we need daily time of interaction with God. I was talking with uh, Josh and Megan Eight at their house tonight and saying, um, you know, what have, what have you learned? What are some life lessons you've learned over the years? And one of the things Megan said was, as a kid, I grew up and dad was always, make sure you have your devotions, make sure you have your devotions. And she said, you know, when I was younger, it's like, okay, we got to do the devotions. But she said, I realized it's essential to my relationship with God. And we talked about as married people, you know, I'm, normally I'm with my wife all day long. We're in the same trailer. We go to church together at night. But there are times we'll sit up against the, the bedboard or the headboard of the bed, and now we really have to talk because although we've been together, we haven't communicated. 31 years of marriage, I will tell you, I love Angela more than I ever have in my life. Our marriage is wonderful. I love her. But one of the keys is we have to communicate. And if you're married, you know, you've got to make time to communicate. You don't just communicate because you're in the same room together. You might feel like you're on the same wave, wavelength, but have you ever talked and realized I was not even realizing that she was thinking this. Okay, that's why the Lord and I were having a talk along the canal yesterday. Because I said, Lord, I know I'm not right because I'm stressed right now. Dwelling in the secret places, you get along with God, you communicate, you talk to the Lord. I love uh, Ron Hamilton's song called My Quiet Time. He said, before I start each day, there is a special place I love to get alone and seek my Savior's face. I find wisdom in his word to instruct me in his will, and I hear his gentle voice say, my child, be still. Yeah, my quiet time alone with God each day. You and I need it. And that's what the psalm prioritizes. So there's personal time with God prioritized, but then notice there's protection from God promised. Look at the second part of verse 1. He shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In fact, Jim Elliott wrote a, a book called Shadow of the Almighty. It's one of the more influential books I've read in my life. Jim Elliott, uh, the missionary to the Alca Indians in, in um, Ecuador. His wife, Elizabeth Elliott, uh, authored Through Gates of Splendor, another classic. If you've never read it, you ought to read it. But uh, Shadow of the Almighty, based on this particular psalm, verse 2, I'll say of the Lord, he's my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Okay, think about it. He's my refuge. I think I mentioned this the other day, but what's, what's something you can't do at a wildlife refuge? Can't hunt, yeah. Animals are safe there. When, when Bill and I were playing golf today, there were five deer along one of the holes that we were playing, and they were not bothered at all by us being there, you know. Nobody's shooting any. Now, we were firing some shots, but they weren't, you know, they weren't, they weren't with gunpowder, okay. But uh, these deer, they're not bothered by humans there. Because right now, nobody's killing on the golf course, okay? The Lord's my refuge. He's my safe space. 
it's, it's amazing to me. We, we live in a culture people are oh, snowflakes. I mean, I'm sorry, but it is unbelievable. In fact, I, this, this is an aside, but there's a reason I'm telling this aside. I, I heard a fellow interviewing a uh, modern psychiatrist recently, recently and she was, she was conservative, and he was saying, what is, what is um, the cost we're seeing because of the absence of fathers in the home in our day? We all know, if there's not a dad present in the home, those kids are way more likely to end up with a criminal record than kids who have both parents in the home. I don't know if you know that. That's true across the, the uh, spectrum. And she said, oh, she said, definitely the, the, the father's presence in the home is so important. Oh, I know. I was, I, I was listening to Dan Bongino talk about this. He said, I remember when I was a dad, young dad, he said, I'd throw my kids up in the air and catch them, you know, and throw them up in the air and catch them. And he said, like, my wife would never do that. She said, exactly the point. She said men and women interact differently with kids, and she said because moms don't do that, kids don't grow up with a sense of risk and, and, and uh, overcoming your fears. Did any of you, ever, your dad say, okay, jump to me, catch you? My dad did that to me all the time, like, Ooh, I'll catch you, go, and you're like, no, my dad didn't do that. Well, you know what? I, I survived, and uh, it helped me to learn it's okay. Men and women deal with things differently. That's why we're both needed. But the Lord wants you and me to realize he's our protector. He's our refuge. Notice another word, fortress. What's a fortress? A stronghold, a fortification. He's our God. Sometimes we're so used to using that term. But what makes God different than us? Oh, I mean, you think a zillion things make God different from us. Yeah, but among others, almighty, yeah. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. We're not but he is. At that point, I studied it out. I was ready to move on. But I cracked open a commentary from John Phillips. And I like Phillips a lot. And he's got some really good in insights. And I would not have noticed this had I not seen this in the writings of John Phillips. This is not original with me. I want to give credit. But John Phillips points out that in verses 1 and 2, there are four distinct names of God that are noted. It was so transformative to me, I want to share it with you. Uh, notice here, he says in verse 1, he that dwells in the secret place of what? Of who, I should say? Of whom? Yeah, the Most High. Okay, here's the first of four names used. You might want to jot these down under protection from God promise. Just put a little bullet and write Most High. The Hebrew name, I'll just spell it for you, the English equivalent, okay? It's capital E-L-Y-O-N. l y o n l E-L-Y-O-N, Elyon. What does Elyon mean? Literally means possessor of heaven and earth. He's the most high. You know, uh, like if you ever rented property from somebody, you, you don't make improvements on the house unless you talk to whom? The owner, the landlord, right? Okay, he's the most high. So the word possession comes into view here. He owns everything. He's the most high. There is, you know, you don't go to God and say, hey, I want to talk to the supervisor. <laughs> there is nobody above God. Have you ever called, like, to dispute a credit card charge or whatever? And you know how that goes. And you're like, can I just talk to a living human being, okay? And you finally get a living, breathing being, but they're on some other continent, and you realize this is not going to go well. And so you finally say, look, could I just talk to a Supervisor, you've been, I, obviously I've been there, right? Okay. You, you don't have to do that with God. You can't go higher than God. And by the way, there is nobody more empowered or powerful than God. So he's the most high, possessor of heaven and earth. But then notice this, end of verse 1, uses another term for him, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The term Almighty is Shaddai, capital S-H-A-D, D-A-I, S-H-A-D-D-A-I, Shaddai. What does Shaddai mean? It means lavish provider. Provision is the thought here. Okay, think about, um, we call him Jehovah Jireh, the Lord shall provide. He's the lavish provider. Think, think about this, um, Philippians 4.19, I'll start it, you finish it. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Okay, think about this. Oh, no. All my money in my 401k or all my money in my investments, it's all based on the American dollar. What happens if BRICS comes into play? What happens if the American dollar is no more the currency of the world? Oh, what about Bitcoin? What about cryptocurrency? Oh, my goodness. I don't know if I'm going to have a 
secure future or not. God says he'll provide all your need according to his riches where? In glory. Not your 401k. Not your investments. You do what you can do, but you trust God to do what you can't do. And by the way, you want to know the path to financial security? I'll give it to you. Luke 6.38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. Interesting, shall men give into your bosom. That's not just eternal reward in the sweet by and by. That's this time in life. You invest in God's program. You invest in God's people. And God promises he'll take care of your needs. That's how you lay up treasure in heaven. He's the lavish provider. So there's uh, possession, there's provision. But then notice the term Lord. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord. We've been through this, what, three times this week? L-O-R-D, that name is Jehovah, capital J-E-H-O-V-A-H, Jehovah. We don't know exactly how they said it. Sometimes you'll see it spelled Yahweh. Okay, they would substitute the name Adonai, which means the Lord. But what is Jehovah? The name means I am that I am. He's the God who exists, has always existed, and will forever exist. And the idea here is the word promise. Why the word promise? Well, think about this. How many times did you attempt to make a promise to somebody, but something else preempted it? Did you ever say, hey, kids, we're going to go camping this weekend. I promise. And then it rains, and you can't go camping. Or you promised. All right, I know last year we didn't get away for vacation. You know, it was COVID last year, whatever. But this year, I promise we're going to take vacation. And then the week you're going to head out of town, the boss says, I'm sorry, but we have the corporate CEO coming in, and all hands on deck, we... Something unforeseen prevents you keeping your promise. Listen, guess who never has anything unforeseen come his way? The Lord. He is the I am that I am. So he is the great promise keeper because he's never made a promise that he will not fully keep. He's your Lord. Wow. And then there's another term here. Notice in the end of verse 2. Um, he is my God. My fortress, my God. That is the name Elohim, capital E. L O Elohim, H I M, like him. Elohim. And what does Elohim mean? Well, that's the term for the creator. And that speaks of his power. How, how did God create the world? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He said, Let there be light. And there was light. The scripture says, He spoke and it was done. It was by His word. Okay, think about this. So we have, we have possession, provision, promise power, all wrapped up in the person of God. I would have totally missed that had I not seen that from John Phillips, but I will tell you, that's worth the whole message tonight right there, and I can't even take credit for it. I'm just passing it on. But man, what a God we serve. That's the premise for this whole psalm. All right, we need to pick up speed. So go to verse 3. So we look at a premise established. Then we look at this, a picture enhanced. Look at 3 to 8 with me. Verse 3, surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. From the noisome pestilence, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, for, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. All right, notice a picture in hand. So let's start with this. There's a bird analogy. And then I'll just give it to you so you can get ahead of me if you want here. There's a bird analogy and there's a battle analogy. Okay, there's an avian analogy and an army analogy. Okay, avian, if you go to an aviary, what would be in the aviary? Birds, okay. So I could be technical and do aviary and army, but we'll go bird and battle, okay. So there's a bird analogy and there's a battle analogy. Now, interesting. When he says in verse 3, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Okay, what is a snare? Another word for snare? Yeah. A trap. Okay, and this is not hard. Okay, big, big, big hint here. What does a fowler try to trap? Yeah. Birds, yeah, fowl, right. Okay, yeah. He'll deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. If you're a bird, what might be a threat to your well-being? Well, certainly traps, but also disease. Interesting, you know what noisome pestilence is? It's widespread disease. He'll deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. Heard about a missionary years ago. He was in Africa. 
He was in um, the plains of Africa. It was an arid area, grasslands, no trees around. The people would build houses out of, of mud bricks, and for roofing, they'd just put on grass thatch. That's all they had, and they were poverty-stricken. And so this man's trying to reach these uh, African people with the gospel, and he said, dry season came and a horrific fire came through the grasslands and it burned up everything. And the village, you can imagine those thatch roofs burn up and then everything inside burn up. And these people who are already living in poverty, all of a sudden they are just trying to put their lives back together. And this missionary, he's, he's trying to reach them, but now everybody's just in survival mode. And so one day he said, I, you know, everybody's doing their rebuilding and all, and there wasn't much I could do at the time. And he said, I, I had a lot of time to pray and to think. How am I going to reach these dear people? He was out walking on the outskirts of the village, and he came across a little nest. And on the top of this nest were the charred remains of a hen. This poor chicken had been burned. And he thought, man, everything was affected by this fire. And, you know, why do we do what we do? In, in sheer exasperation, he kind of kicked at the chicken's charred body with his heel of his boot. The chicken fell off the nest, but out from underneath scurried three living chicks. Startled him. And then it dawned on him. Those chicks survived because that mother literally covered them with her feathers. And then he had an analogy. One had to give its life so others could live. And that was the message he used to preach the gospel to those people. That's the picture there. He'll cover thee with his feathers. Can you think of any area that the Lord has proven to us that he's willing to suffer personal harm that you and I might be protected? The cross above all else, right? He'll cover thee with his feathers. That's the bird analogy. But then right in the middle of verse 4, he switches. Now, you and I, we'd be, we'd be written up in school English class for mixing metaphors. But in the Bible, there were mixed metaphors all the time, okay? So you can tell your English teacher that. But uh, pick up in the middle of verse 4. He goes from the bird analogy then to a battle analogy. Look, his truth... End of verse 4. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Okay, interesting. The word shield here, this is not like a Captain America shield. It's not like one of those round shields. This is one of those shields that literally went from head to toe, full length. You've seen depictions of ancient warfare where like the Roman soldiers or the Greeks, they would have these giant shields that they literally would put side to side and they could create a wall. Okay, that's the term shield. And then um, he'll be thy buckler. Now, a buckler was a, was a uh, semicircle shaped shield. So what it would do is give you protection from anywhere in the front. Now, interesting, it wouldn't protect your back. But if you're making an advance, it would protect you from multiple angles up front. I mean, it would be like saying in modern vernacular, he'll be your body armor. Okay, that's the idea. He's going to be your shield. So that's part of the battle analogy. Then keep going in verse 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. I remember 1990 when um, Desert Shield, Operation Desert Shield was in effect, and then Operation Desert Storm broke out. It was the first time I ever remember seeing night vision technology. And it was kind of greenish and ghoulish looking at the time, but, you know, I remember watching news coverage of, of the war and thinking, I'll tell you what, those poor guys that don't have night vision, the guys with the night vision sure have an upper hand over the guys who don't. Notice, you're not going to be afraid for the terror by night. Battle in broad daylight would be terrifying enough, but fighting at night when you can't see what's coming your way? I thought about, you know, how about today assassins literally can take somebody out a mile away. Fighter jets can launch rockets from miles away and hit targets. Terror by night. Nor for the arrow that flieth by day. That would be like today saying bullets flying all around you. Not going to be afraid for the weapons flying around you. Verse uh, 6, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. What's pestilence? Again, that's widespread disease. I read last year um, McCullough's book, 1776. It was about Washington at Valley Forge. Fascinating. If, if, if you're a student of history, and I'd, I'd recommend being one, those who do not learn from history are destined to repeat its mistakes. So I was reading uh, 1776 by McCullough last year, and he said, you know, one of the tragedies of Valley Forge was, at the time, only about a third of the colonists were still in favor of seeking independence from England. Uh, it was not the public sentiment. Aren't you glad that the uh, minority won out? 
And uh, because a lot of the militiamen, their two-year conscription was up, and, and it was not a national army. These were local militias, and they were going home. They, and Congress didn't have enough money to pay up. Oh, and by the way, back then, Congress didn't print money that it didn't have. Good idea. Uh, so they, didn't, they had, you know, no shoes on their feet and whatever, and there was a real low ebb of mor morale going on at the time. But McCullough pointed out the most devastating incident that occurred at Valley Forge was widespread dysentery. There was just disease all through the camp. And Washington lost troops left and right with not even a shot being fired. If, if you study war at all, you'll find out that uh, d d the disease in the camp is, is just as much a consideration as the warfare of the enemy. God says, I'll protect you from that. Notice, uh, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. The obvious things you'd expect in broad daylight. Yeah. Like destruction, what, what about things like weapons of mass destruction? I mean, today people think, oh man, some of these crazies out there, what if they ever decided to use their nuclear weapons? You know, you can live your life in fear or you can walk in the fear of God. I'm going to tell you something, you can't control all these catastrophic possibilities out there, but guess who promises, I've got you? The Lord does. So that's the battle analogy. I love history, as you figured out, and I, I, one of the great examples of this comes from an incident in World War II. Psalm 91 is often called the Soldier's Psalm, and I delved into that. Okay, why is it called the Soldier's Psalm? It particularly became known as that during World Wars I and II, but I found a really compelling incident for it in um, World War II, the Battle of Dunkirk. Now, the United States had not yet joined the cause of the Allies. We were not in the war at that point. But the Battle of Dunkirk was on the beaches of France, and there was a large, a vast army that had been encircled and trapped at the beaches of Dunkirk, and it looked like they were days away from total annihilation. King George VI was, pres uh, was uh, king at the time of England. Uh, that was Elizabeth's father. You might, he was Prince Albert, who became George VI. So Queen future Queen Elizabeth's father, um, said to his subjects in England, in fact, to, you know, all around the British Empire, he, he put out an appeal, India, um, Jamaica, you know, even Canada, even people in the U.S., although we were separate from England at the time, he appealed to them, go to your churches and pray for a miracle. How often do you hear that from a government leader, right? Pray for a miracle. That, they knew it was bad. So people all over the world were praying. Well, God intervened. Listen to this. There were four distinct miracles that occurred at Dunkirk. First of all, amazingly, inexplicably, Hitler ordered the halt of his armored unit's advance. The armored unit was coming, the tanks were coming, and would have had opportunity for a complete bloodbath, but Hitler told them to stop. It's really interesting. You study World War II, you'll find out Hitler made a number of strategic blunders. And uh, Normandy is another example. And I can point to other examples in history. The Spanish Armada, you know, and, and a storm comes up. And, you know, we could go into all kinds of acts of providence. But how did Hitler make these blunders? Well, providence of God. Now, there was a reason Hitler had stopped the advance of his armored unit. Why was it? Well, there's another factor. Number two was an unprecedented storm had come in over France at that time. It was not typically the rainy season, but this horrific storm had come in. That prevented the German planes from flying, the Luftwaffe. And so because the, the fighters could not fly, Hitler knew he had no air support for his armored unit, so he put that to a halt. But concurrent with all that, there was a third miracle. There was an unprecedented calm on the English Channel. That narrow body of water between England and France. Now think, there's a raging storm going on over France, but there's an unusual calm going on over the channel. How do you explain that? And what was at the time the largest naval evacuation in history occurred during that time? There were naval vessels coming. There were fishing vessels coming. There were private pleasure craft coming. And it was all hands on deck. Anybody with anything that floated was being sent to Dunkirk, and they were literally evacuating men. In fact, the numbers are staggering. I had to write it down. I, I, it was unbelievable. 338,266 were evacuated from the beaches of Dunkirk. 388,000. But there was one more miracle. 
There's a group of 400 Englishmen who were pinned down on the beach of Dunkirk, and they were being strafed by German machine gunners, etc. And it looked like they were facing complete death. But all of these men had memorized the 91st Psalm. And they began to quote in unison, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge, my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. They went through the entire psalm. Interestingly, not one man of that 400 received a single scratch. They all survived and got off the beach. Now, I know when I tell that story, some people think like, sign me up. You know, I'll, I'll get a pendant. I'll wear it around my neck. I, I can imagine some guy nowadays like, tattoo it on my bicep right there, Psalm 91. Look, we're not dealing with a lucky rabbit's foot here. But it is a promise from God for protection. So that brings us to the last, because I'm sure you've had some of these thoughts in your mind, and I want to give you a promise elaborated, verses 9 to 16. Because I'm sure as you're hearing that, you're thinking, yeah, but I've known people that died in battle. I remember uh, I was at uh, Maranatha Baptist Church in Shelby, North Carolina a couple years ago, and Brother Larry Brubaker came to hear me, and he, he and Ron Comfort traveled together for years, and uh, Bruce is a good friend. And he said, hey, Rich, have you ever heard the story of Glenn Schunk? And I knew the name, but I didn't know Glenn Schunk. He was an evangelist. I said, no, Bruce, I haven't. He said, I want to give you this, and it was the life story of Glenn Schunk. I th I, they may have done it on Unshackled. I can't remember. But uh, it was a well, life story, and so I'm listening to this. And Glenn Schunk was a Baptist evangelist, and he, um, he had been uh, drafted into World War II. And here he is living out his faith. He would kneel by his bunk every night and pray. And he had guys throw boots at him and mock his faith, you know. But he said it didn't matter. I was committed to the Lord. He said, but I was, I was assigned to be a machine gunner. And he said, it's really interesting. As the war went on, he said, everybody wanted to be in my foxhole. Because God let me survive battle after battle without a scratch. He said, I had bullets flying all around me. He said, I had men dying all around me, but for God's own reasons, not a single scratch. He said, I had guys blown up in my foxhole. But he said, I survived. But he said, most of the time, both of us, or all of us, would survive. And he said, everybody wanted to be in my foxhole. He said, now, toward the end of the war, the Lord allowed me to take a piece of shrapnel, I think it was. And he said, I got honorably discharged. But he said, God used that to bring me back to the States and commence my ministry. He said, but it was like I was under perfect protection until God said, time to go home. Interesting. Okay, so look at verse 9 with me. A promise elaborated. Uh, verse 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Now if you go back to 7, he says, a thousand will fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, not come nigh you. Statistically, everybody, everybody might be dropping dead, but I'm going to protect you, he says. What about verse 8? Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. You say, what does that mean? You probably know. What's, what's the reward of the wicked? I'll give you a hint. The wages of sin is, yeah, only with your eyes you'll see the reward of the wicked. And then verse 9, because thou. Now, you know the word thou in Scripture is singular, right? Do you know even in King James Day they didn't talk like that? Do you know that? That was literary. If, if you read the preface to the King James, it says, Unto you, O king, be it known. How many kings were there? Only one. They used the word you. Yeah, that's conversational English. But they would distinguish between thee and thou or ye and you because, you know, like um, in English, when we say you, am I talking to you or am I talking to you? Up here we say you guys, right? How do they say it in the south? Y'all. Okay, how do they say it in Illinois and central Pennsylvania? Yins. Okay, what's yins? I guess it's you individuals. I don't know, but, you know, so y'all, yous, guys, yins. Okay, that's plural. But thee or thou, that's singular. Okay, now, notice here. Because thou, because you as an individual, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. This is an individual relationship. This is not a promise just because you're part of a church. It's not a promise just because one was a member of the nation of Israel. It's an individual relationship. Let me tell you, if you don't have an individual relationship with God, you are not promised this protection. 
you probably heard of unsaved people that made all kinds of promises to God. I remember reading the story Unbroken by Louis Zamperini. Fascinating book. And Louis Zamperini was a world-renowned athlete, but he was gunned down during World War II and taken to a Japanese prison camp and tortured relentlessly. Well, while he was drifting in a raft for over 40 days, he and, he and some other guys were crying out for help and help. And he promised, God, if you save me from this, I'll serve you. And interesting, he went through horrific torture. He ended up going to the first Billy Graham area-wide meeting in Los Angeles, California. Back when the, the song leader at that one was not Cliff Barrow, it was Al uh, Smith. And in 1949, and Louis Zamperini got saved the week of Graham's first conference out in uh, Los Angeles, California. Interesting. But like a lot of guys, you know, Lord, if you get me out of Now, he wasn't saved. But God in his mercy kept him alive. If you're a child of God, you can claim this promise. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Now, I'm going to elaborate because I, I can anticipate where thoughts are going. Let me break it down this way. First of all, there's a promise of exemption from evil. Have you ever heard the name Corey Ten Boom? Okay, Corey Ten Boom, famous for uh, what book? The Hiding Place. What, what were her family known for? What heroics did they participate in? Hiding Jews during the Nazi invasion of Holland. Do you remember that story? So they had a hidden room in their house where they would, at their own peril, they would hide the Jews. Now, Corey and her family were not Jewish. They were born-again Christians. But they, they knew this is God's people. We're going to give safe harbor to them. And they put their lives on the line. Well, Corey's dad would constantly quote with his family Psalm 91. Now, Corey's mom had died before the war, so she wasn't around. But it was Corey, her sister, her dad. There was a brother. I forget how many. But um, all of them knew at any time their lives would be at risk. But their dad would constantly lead them in quoting this. Well, for over a year, they safely gave protection to Jews. Eventually, somebody ratted them out. And they, I think it was a family member, in fact, distant family. And they ended up being uh, arrested. And she said, I'll never forget, we went to the, the uh, jail there, I think it was in Amsterdam, and she said, we're all standing around together, and it was the last time we would see each other. And she said, as they're processing us, my dad gathered us and said, children, come around. And in unison, we began to quote Psalm 91. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is thy, my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. We know the amazing story. Corey's dad was taken to a men's camp right after that. Corey and her sister Betsy were carried off to a women's camp. They were forced to be seamstresses in this uh, camp, and they had to sew uniforms, etc., for the Nazis. And it was rigorous work. In fact, Corey often complained that th they found themselves in a barracks that was infested with fleas. And Corey said, Betsy, I don't understand this. Why would God, who allowed us to be arrested, now have us in a barracks full of fleas? And Betsy said, Corey, you don't see the blessing in it? Blessing? Sister, I hardly see a blessing in a flea-infested barracks. She said, Corey, think about it. None of the guards dare come into this barracks. She said, we have total freedom to converse among ourselves. They were able to smuggle a Bible into the barracks, and they led numerous of their fellow prisoners to Christ, some right before they died. Corey and Betsy often conversed, and Betsy said, you know, Corey, I believe you will survive this war. And she said, and when you do, she said, I believe that you will travel the world and tell people about how a family like ours could forgive those who have done so much wrong to them. Corey said, Betsy, what about you? You'll survive too. She said, no, Corey, I don't know that I will. She said, B -b -b Betsy, we've been claiming God's promise of protection. She said, Corey, if they kill me, what's the worst thing that happens to me? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. One year after they were arrested, one year to the day, a clerical error led to Corey being liberated from the camp. It was a mistake. And she was set free and would travel the world telling people about the grace of God. Interestingly, Betsy also would have been released, except she died one week before they got out. You might say, what about that? 
Yeah, in fact, Betsy and Corey's dad died within a week of being arrested. Maybe it was 10 days of his initial arrest. The man who'd been teaching them Psalm 91, he died. Yeah, what about that? You know, brother, honestly, some people, we pray and pray, and God does a miraculous and delivers them from cancer, and then other people die of cancer. I mean, you know. In fact, I hate to use the crude analogy, but I think some people think God's promises are sort of like Russian roulette. Admittedly crude, but you know what Russian roulette? You put one bullet in a chamber, you spin the chamber, and then you pull the trigger, and five out of six, you don't get it. But somebody gets the bullet. I'm honestly afraid that some Christians have that idea that that's just how it is with God. Some of us are blessed that the promises work out, and others, well, not so lucky. We're not dealing with luck. We're dealing with the sovereignty of God. We're dealing with the goodness of God. So let me peel back some more layers as we go along. So we have exemption from evil. He promises that. Then we have angelic attention. Look at verses 11 and 12. He says, uh, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. That, that goes along with Psalm 34, 7. Uh, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Do you know there is such a thing as guardian angels? My family have often talked about it. It must be a bummer to be assigned to an evangelist if you're a guardian angel. I mean, you know how many miles evangelists travel? You know how many cities we go to? We have no idea what the safe part of town is. I wonder how many times going into Walmart at night I, you know, took my life in my hands. But angelic protection, God promises it. How many of you have ever looked back and you said, we, we I think, had a near brush with death except for the protection of God? Anybody ever see that in your life? Yeah. When you go to New York, New York City, you're taking your life in your hands, right? Okay. I've done that plenty. Uh, then we have, in verse 13, protection from predators. Look at 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. Okay, an adder is a cobra, poisonous snake. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. So these are venomous, poisonous beasts. I remember hearing the story about David Brainerd. David Brainerd's... Potential father-in-law was the president at Princeton Seminary at one time, Jonathan Edwards. You probably know that name. David Brainerd was going to marry Jonathan Edwards' daughter, but he came down with tuberculosis. David Brainerd was a mighty intercessor. He was a man of prayer, and his focus was on the American Indian, the indigenous American, Native Americans. And so David Brainerd knew these people were very um, spiritistic in their orientation. They were very skeptical about white man religion. So, you know, if people won't let you talk to them about God, what do you do? When you can't talk to men about God, you can always talk to God about men. So that's what Brainerd did. He would get out in the woods and he would pray for hours. Well, one day he was praying. It was autumn. The leaves had fallen. And there was a tribal chief with his men that they were planning to ambush David Brainerd. So they caught him. They knew he was a man of prayer. They knew he'd get alone. There'd be no one to help him. And the chief was there, and his men had drawn their bows. They were ready to fire arrows into David Brainerd. And all of a sudden, the chief said, hold fire. He noticed behind David Brainerd, a, a rattlesnake had coiled up. It was in a strike position. The man said, the chief said to his braves, Great spirit of sky may do work for us. So he watched as the snake coiled, and then, without explanation, that snake released its coil and slithered off into the woods. The men looked at their chief. He said, great spirit of sky may have protected this man. A couple days later, Brainerd wandered into their camp and said he wanted to speak to the chief, and the chief granted him a hearing and when the chief told him what happened, Brainerd said, I did not know that the snake was there, but I do know that my God has afforded me protection because he wants you to hear the message. And eventually the chief and all his men came to saving faith in Christ. In answer to prayer and through the protection of God. Finally, there's one last area, and I'll draw all this together for you. It's deliverance for the devoted. Look at verses 14 to 16. Because thou hast... Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. Okay, notice this is a promise for the one who loves God. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. You know, if you're in a time of flood, you want to move to high ground, right? I'll set him on high because he's known my name. Verse 15, he shall call upon me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Okay, so there he says he'll, he'll satisfy you with long life. 
Betsy Ten Boom died in camp. Yeah, she's not the only. I mentioned earlier the name Jim Elliott. You remember Jim Elliott and five young missionaries went to reach the Alka Indians? There was Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, the missionary pilot, Ed McCullough, Pete Fleming, Roger Gadaria. Finally, they had been trying to reach the Alkas, and they decided now's the time. And they, they devised a system where they could land their Piper plane down on a sandbar, and, and they were going to go out and speak to the tribesmen. The day had come, and that day, all five of those men were thrust through with spears. They were killed. They were young men. They had wives. They had little children. Interestingly, do you know that those men were armed? They had sidearms. They had firearms with them. But they had agreed, if we are attacked, we will not fire on our attackers. Because if we die, we go to heaven. If they die, they go to hell. They knew the risk they were taking. And when they were thrust through with spears, they willingly died so those men would not die in destruction. You may know the story. Elizabeth Elliot, Jim's wife, and Rachel Saint, Nate Saint's sister, later went back to the Alcas after their husbands and loved ones had been slain. And that entire tribe came to saving faith in Christ. And one of the things that turned the hearts of those natives was how these women could still care to give them the gospel after their men had been killed by these natives. You say, okay, so, like, maybe you get protection, maybe you don't. Okay, let me just reason with you for a minute. Does God's protection mean that Christians will never die? No, we all know that. So what's the point? You're not going to die till God's appointed time. If you're walking with him. Corey Ten Boom, freed from prison. Betsy dies in prison. But God is good. Listen, we're not talking about jump off the top of the Empire State Building and say, hey, God will protect me. No, he tells you not to do that. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. But when you're walking in fellowship with him, listen, nothing can happen to you until God's perfect time if you're in fellowship with him. But you don't need to live in fear when Israel and Hezbollah are at war and Ukraine's at war and a couple assassination attempts on a former president and what's going to happen in the elections. And look, pet peeve, but I'm going to say this not just as an individual. I want to say this as a preacher of God. It bothered me immensely that a lot of people put more stock in what Anthony Fauci said than in what the Bible says. Some people were living in fear over Fauci. Folks, listen, Fauci is not infallible. And it upset me that more people got more rattled about, oh, Dr. Fauci said, where's your trust in God? Where's your trust in his word? The whole six feet of social distancing, they made it up. There was no science behind that. And it bugged me when we had this idea, you can meet at Home Depot, you can go out to the liquor store, but you can't meet in church. Beg your pardon? Wrong. I don't know what your political views are, frankly, I don't care. But I want to tell you something, as a Christian, as a preacher, it bothered me when people put more stock in what Fauci said, or the CDC, than in what God says. You know when the Lord told, greet one another with a holy kiss? Think about that, they didn't understand germs and all that like we do now, and yet... Do you think God was a super spreader? Back then, they would kiss each other on the cheek and like, well, they didn't have near the cleanliness. Folks, I think one of the most horrible things about COVID was how many people died in isolation and died alone. We need social interaction. We've got kids that are just despondent now, suicidal because of those years of lack of social interaction. So... I'm not simply riding a hobby horse, but I want to tell you, we either believe the Bible or we don't. And God does not want you to live in fear. Do right. Trust him. But do not stress. Do, be careful for nothing. And may God help us to. I don't know what will happen in the months ahead. God already knows. But he wants you to trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto Thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths.
Let's bow our heads together. You listen great. I've preached you long this week, and I'm, I'm so great. You'll be glad to get your pastor back, like get somebody shorter back in the pulpit. I'm talking about length of message, not stature. Lord, please work in our hearts. Help us to see you want us to trust you. It's, it's, it's too often just theoretical when we say, yeah, trust the Lord. May it be reality. May people see it in us. I've, I've had to ask you this week, forgive me, I was, I was stressed, I was feeling worried. And then I'm remembering the scripture that I've committed to memory, and it, it really is therapy to the soul. How many of you can say, you know, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I will admit I needed this text of scripture tonight. Would you hold up your hand? You said, I needed it. I don't know of anybody else, but I need it. Yeah, that's more than half the people here. No wonder God prompted me to preach it. Okay. So what did you need from it? How many of you have already trusted the Lord as your Savior? You, you know that your ultimate destination is heaven. That's settled. Would you hold your hand back up? You say, I know the Lord's my Savior. I'm, no, I'm going to heaven. Okay. So let me ask you who just raised your hand. You say, I'm God's child. But boy, I, I needed this reminder. I just, I needed the reminder that worry is not a virtue. It is actually a sin. And I, I've, I've been justifying myself in worry, and I'm not justified to worry. Anybody need to admit that? Pray for me. I've been worried, and I know I shouldn't. Good for you. Thank you for being honest to admit it. Yeah. So how are you going to handle that? Well, you handle it with the truth. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you take the psalm that we just looked at. It'd be great to memorize. It's only 16 verses. You know, if you memorize one verse a week in, uh, I'm sorry, one verse a day, you'd get through it in two and a half weeks, 16 days. Verse a week, you'd do it in 16 weeks. You can memorize the psalm. What if you just memorize the first seven or eight verses? That'd be a big help. Okay, how, how many of you would say, you know, I was rebuked by the thought that sometimes I do put more stock in what men say than what God says. I didn't mean to be brutal about that, but how many of you say, I needed that, preacher? Anybody? Yeah, I see a few hands. Listen, we got a world around us lost in sin. They need hope. They need help. And the Lord is a very present help in time of need. And we are in time of need. Is there anybody here tonight, you say, Rich, I don't know that I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I've ever been saved. Pray for me. I don't know that God's ever taken away my sin. I don't know if I've come to a right relationship with him. And I've seen children raise a hand each night, and I do again. Is there anybody else, too? You'd say, pray for me. I don't know if my sins have been taken away. I don't know if I'd go to heaven. I've told the kids each night, children, you ought to talk to your mom or dad. Mom, dad, what does it mean to be saved? I'll, I'll tell you this, kids, you'll come to a point when you know you're a bad sinner. It'll seem like everything you do is bad. You'll know you're in trouble for this and trouble for that. When you get to that place, you'll know you're ready to be saved. Mom and Dad, you can help us with that. And I want the kids to be saved. You ought to talk to your mom or dad and say, can I be saved? And parents, you may know to say, yeah, honey, we'll keep talking about that. You're not quite ready yet. You know. You'll help them. I know you will. Let's do this. Would you mind looking up my way and... We need to round it out here, so um, let's stand together. And I think what we'll do is, because we close with a hymn, I think we'll sing one verse, and then we'll close with a hymn in a minute. So here's what I'd ask.